Good evening and welcome to our Bible study. This is week number seven in our study through the book of 2 John. Uh, so far we've had an introduction to the book and we've covered the first six verses. I want to begin this lesson by reading the whole letter. Uh, we haven't done that in a while and hopefully this will serve to refresh your memory and help set the context for the verse we're going to concentrate on this evening. 2 John, beginning reading at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that, as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. We are going to focus on verse 7 in this study. It's where John gets to the main point of the letter. Uh, he was writing to the elect lady to address a particular situation. And this was it. Verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. The threat to the Christian community from false teachers was on John's mind. He didn't want his friend and the church that she belonged to to be deceived. He didn't want their unity, their, their fellowship and their gospel witness to be harmed. We get a sense of this in the next verse. Verse 8, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. There were precious things that would be lost should false teachers be allowed in and their errors be believed. We're going to consider verse 7 under four headings. I'll give them to you up front. Number one, we're going to see what keeps us safe. Then number two, what isn't said. Number three, what the error was. And then finally, heading number four, who they really were. What keeps us safe what isn't said, what the error was, who they really were. That's our outline for this study. And so, first of all, let's take note of what keeps us safe. What was true for John's original readers is true for us. Now, in their day, many deceivers had entered the world. And nearly 20 centuries later, not much has changed. There are many deceivers in our world. Actually, there are a whole lot more. There was, and there still are, many who claim to be bringing the Christian message, but who really are not. Some of these people even knock on our doors from time to time or hand out pamphlets in the street. And then, as we know, there is the internet and the platform that it has provided for countless false teachers and apostate organisations. They can reach into the homes and into the hearts of just about everyone these days. 
the danger to the Christian community remains. False teaching is a threat to our local church, to our Christian lives. We'd be foolish to think that we're somehow immune, that that we could never be deceived. In the words of the Apostle Paul, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. We live at a time where people can, as it were, fall down the rabbit hole. Uh, YouTube and Facebook are powered by algorithms that discern what we're interested in and then feed us suggestions for further viewing and reading. And if we're not careful, our attention can be drawn to teachers and to ministries that stray from orthodoxy, that diverge from what the Bible teaches into speculation and into error. We have to be careful. Uh, The danger uh, to our faith and to our fellowship is real. In the first part of our verse, there is something very important, something that we might easily miss. John tells us what protects the church from false teachers, what keeps us safe. Notice the word for. Verse 7, for many deceivers are entered into the world. Now this word indicates that what John has said in the previous verse has to do with this situation. Love one another, keep his commandments for or because many deceivers are entered into the world. The threat in verse 7 is the reason why John reminded his readers about loving one another in verses 5 and 6, and why he emphasised truth in verses 2 through 4. Truth and love are pillars of protection. A church family that is characterised by truth and love is well placed to avoid being drawn away, deceived and divided by false doctrine. One author expresses it this way, Christian love produces the soil in which false teaching cannot grow. I think we understand how familiarity with the truth protects us from error. You've no doubt heard a preacher give the illustration of how bank tellers used to be trained to recognise counterfeit currency. It wasn't by studying examples of counterfeit notes It was by studying authentic notes, but by becoming well acquainted with genuine currency. And so it is when it comes to the body of Christian doctrine, the deeper our understanding of it, the more equipped we will be to recognise and reject that which is false. We won't be deceived. This we understand, but perhaps we've never thought about love in this way, as being something that keeps us safe from false teaching. The experience of true Christian love goes a long way to removing the appeal of false teaching. Genuine love is the application and the outworking of truth. If people are experiencing that love in the body of Christ, being built up, supported, encouraged, they are far less likely to be drawn away by alternatives that are not really alternatives at all. Love fosters unity among the people of God. False teachers prey on division. People filled with Christian love are concerned about others. False teachers get their foot in the door when people are focused primarily on themselves. When there is a lack of love in a church, when people have been hurt, when people have become disaffected, that's often when they are vulnerable. That's when they're open to being drawn away by false doctrine. It's hard to overstate how important love is. It has this protective power. It guards the community of faith. And this is yet more reason for us to proactively love one another in our assembly. So that's what keeps us safe. Now let's move to the second heading in our outline. And the next thing I want us to see in our verse, and that is what isn't said. Heading number two, what isn't said. 
Notice that John calls out these deceivers not for what they were saying, but for what they weren't saying. Look once more at the text, verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. And we'll get to the details of this particular brand of false doctrine in a moment, but I want to park here for a while. These false teachers probably said a lot of true things. A lot of things that lined up with what was written in the Old Testament and what was taught by Jesus and the Apostles, but they did not affirm this one essential piece of Christian doctrine. And maybe there were others as well, but John focuses in on this fundamental aspect. He focuses in on their Christology. And this is often the way with false teachers. What they don't say, what they don't affirm, is just as important as what they do say. One author puts it this way, what a professed Christian teacher deliberately refuses to acknowledge in dealing with doctrinal matters may be just as revealing as what he openly rejects. The refusal of these false teachers to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh was in fact a repudiation of that concept. No doubt these teachers said a lot of wonderful things about Jesus. And no doubt they spoke of him in exalted terms, but they didn't say this about him, that he had come in the flesh, and that said a lot. By failing to confess his humanity, they were effectively denying it. And by denying it, they completely undermined the gospel and the Christian faith. This was a deadly, soul-destroying error. Now, you will find so-called Christian teachers today who, in their teaching and in interviews, are deliberately unclear, deliberately vague and divisive about key elements of the Christian faith. Now, I'm not talking about secondary matters. I'm not talking about doctrines over which sincere Christians have disagreed for centuries. I'm, I'm talking about doctrines that are definitional to the Christian faith. Uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of sin. The doctrine of hell. A penal substitutionary atonement. The exclusivity of the gospel. Uh, what the Bible teaches about human sexuality. These men and women don't confess what the Bible teaches. They don't affirm historic, orthodox Christian doctrine, either because they don't believe it or because they don't want to offend anyone. They sacrifice truth on the altar of popularity. And what they don't say or won't say says an awful lot. The lesson here is that we have to be careful when it comes to who we watch, who we listen to, who we read, who we follow. I would suggest that you take some time to check out a teacher, check out their ministry or their church, look for a statement of faith, look for things they've written on the core elements of the Christian faith or sermons they've given. If they don't affirm the essential doctrines, then be very wary of everything else they say. Now, they can draw us in because they sound orthodox, and then, if we're not careful, they can plant the seeds of false belief in our minds and in our hearts. The deceivers that the Christian community were dealing with in John's day were peddling error about the person of Christ. And that brings us to the third heading in our outline. We've seen what keeps us safe. What isn't said? Now let's think about what the error was. Heading number three, what the error was. Verse seven. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. These were the same false teachers John addressed in his first epistle, 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Now, this probably seems a bit strange to us. 
And we are much more familiar with groups that deny the deity of Christ. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, the Latter-day Saints and the Christadelphians all have a, a Christology that does this. We don't normally come across supposedly Christian groups or teachers that deny the humanity of Christ. Uh, they deny that Jesus was a real flesh and blood human being. But that's what these teachers did. And of course, it had devastating consequences for the gospel. If Jesus was not truly human, then he did not die for sin. There, there is no atonement. The cross has no meaning and there is no resurrection. The incarnation lies at the very centre of God's plan of redemption. And that's what these teachers denied. They denied the real embodiment, the real enfleshment of God in Christ. As far as false teaching goes, this was about as profound as it gets. This was a, a knife to the heart of the Christian message. This teaching was what theologians later on called docetism, from the Greek word dokeo, which means to seem. The idea was that Jesus only seemed to be human that he only seemed to die. His human form was an illusion. Uh, in reality, he was only a spirit being. Again, this probably sounds a bit weird to us, but this understanding of the person of Jesus was the product of a larger worldview, of what church historians and theologians call Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism developed into a more coherent and comprehensive system of belief in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, but the seeds of Gnostic thought were probably present in John's day, and that's what shaped the worldview of these teachers and led to their heterodox Christology. They attempted to blend the dualism of Gnosticism with Christian teaching. Dualism being the idea that matter is bad, that which is physical is worthless or corrupt or evil, and that which is spirit is good. Now it would take a series of studies to get our heads around Gnosticism and the way it impacted the early church, and it would be totally fascinating, at least for me, but maybe less so for you. So for the sake of brevity, I want to share an extended quote from the work of Dr. Justo Gonzalez, in Volume 1 of his highly regarded History of Christian Thought, he provides an excellent summary of Gnostic thought and its intersection with Christian theology. The words will be on the screen. I'll see if you can follow along. When the general Gnostic view was co-joined with Christian teaching, there were three basic points at which most Christians felt that their faith was threatened. The doctrine of creation and of the divine rule over the world, the doctrine of salvation, and Christology. Gnosticism was opposed to the traditional Christian doctrine of creation because it saw in the material world not the work of the eternal God, but the result of an error committed by an inferior and evil or ignorant being. According to the Gnostics, the things of this world are not merely worthless, but even evil. In this way, they were opposed to the mainstream of the Judeo-Christian tradition, which affirmed that all things were made by God, who still acts in the history of the world. From this first disagreement between Gnosticism and traditional Christianity, there followed a similar disagreement regarding the doctrine of salvation. According to Gnosticism, salvation consists in the liberation of the divine and immortal spirit that is imprisoned within the human body. The latter's role in the plan of salvation is merely negative. Over against this view, most Christians affirm that salvation included the human body and that the final fulfilment of God's plan for the salvation of men will not take place without the resurrection of the body. Finally, and here we come to what John was dealing with in our text, finally, Gnostic dualism had devastating consequences when applied to Christology. If matter, and above all this matter which forms our bodies, is not the product of divine will, 
but rather of some other principle that is opposed to that will, it follows that matter and the human body cannot serve as a vehicle for the revelation of the supreme God. Therefore Christ, who came to make that God known to man, cannot have come in the flesh. His body cannot have been a truly physical body, but only a bodily appearance. His sufferings and his death cannot be real, for it is inconceivable that the supreme God would thus give himself up to the evil and destructive power of matter. Thus the Gnostics are led to the Christological doctrine that is known as Docetism, from the Greek dokeo, to seem or suppose. Over against this theory, most Christians affirmed that in Jesus of Nazareth, in his body, in his life, his sufferings, his death and resurrection, is to be found the saving revelation of God. The Jesus these teachers presented was the product of what was essentially a pagan worldview. Because they rejected what we're told in Genesis chapters 1, 2 and 3 and instead embraced an alternative cosmology, they ended up with a totally different concept of salvation and a totally different Jesus. A Jesus who couldn't save anyone. And this is why John goes on to say what he does in our text. That brings us finally to heading number four. Who they really were. That is these teachers. Verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now what doesn't come through here in our King James translation is the use of the definite article. In the original language, John has the word the before the word deceiver and before the word antichrist. Literally, the text reads, this is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now, John wasn't thinking about eschatology here. Uh, he didn't have in view a single individual who was to come. This is not a prophetic text. Rather, he was talking about a group of people who were already in the world. In fact, he said as much in his first epistle, chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. And by using this language in our verse, John was endeavouring to be very clear and very direct. One author explains it this way. The demonstrative pronoun this stresses that this is the true identity of every individual belonging to this group. The definite article with both nouns, the deceiver and the antichrist, stresses that he personally embodies the characteristics conveyed by both of these terms. The former term mainly portrays his relation to men as seeking to deceive them and lead them astray from the truth in Christ. The latter stresses his personal rejection of the incarnate Christ and his desire to replace him with a Christ of his own devising. The prefix anti in antichrist means to be against, as in uh, antibacterial and antisocial. But it can also communicate the idea of in the place of or instead of. These two ideas come together in this term, Antichrist. These false teachers were against Christ because they were presenting a false Christ in his place. And we believe the Bible speaks of the Antichrist, an individual empowered by Satan who will one day come and perpetrate the greatest deception of all. This is probably the figure who Paul calls the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the beast who John describes in Revelation chapter 13. But there is a sense in which he is already here. He's been here since Jesus ascended into heaven. In 1 John chapter 4 verse 3, the apostle speaks of the spirit of Antichrist which is already in the world. There are Antichrists all around us. Who are they? 
Well, they're not the atheists or the occultists. They're not the Wiccans and the warlocks. And this word Antichrist conjures up all kinds of satanic imagery that has more to do with Hollywood than Holy Scripture. The Antichrists in the world today are the same as those who John had in mind when he penned these words. They are people who proclaim a false Christ. Those who present a Jesus other than the one the Scriptures reveal. And for the most part, they are lovely, well-meaning people. Yet, they are perpetrating deadly error. A deception that takes men and women to hell. These antichrists deserve much more of our attention than the antichrist who will one day come. Their errors should be of greater concern to us as should their everlasting souls. They deceive others usually because they have been deceived themselves. There are many deceivers in our world today. As God's people, we need to hide behind these pillars of protection, the things that keep us safe, God's revelation of truth and authentic love for one another. We need to be careful about who we listen to, who we allow to shape and influence our thinking. We need to pay attention to what Christian teachers don't say as much as to what they do say. And we ought to care deeply about our doctrine, especially the doctrine of Christ. We need to know it thoroughly. We, we ought to treasure it, to, to guard it, and to be concerned about those who pervert it. May God help us. May God bless you. Amen.